Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman. I work with the Skate Riot Ministry and host the 1015 online service. We are really glad that you are here to worship with us and here are some opportunities that you can get more involved. The next women's Bible study begins Wednesday, September 6th. It is called Lies Women Believe and you can order your copy now. Email Women's Ministry with any questions about the study or you can visit the Welcome Center after service. Hesperia Days is coming up. We need people to represent Living Hope at our booth on Saturday, September 16th. We will be handing out flyers, assisting with games, and helping visitors with activities. You can sign up for a time block at the Welcome Center after service. Our church will also be representing in the 5K that morning at 7.30. Come out and walk, skate, or run with us. Sign-ups for that are done through HesperiaParks.com. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in our spiritual walk. We want to help you do that. If you are new to our church or you haven't given us any information about you and you're just kind of looking around, we would love to get to know you better. You can scan the welcome code on the back of the seat in front of you, or you can visit the Welcome Center on your way out. If you've been coming for a while, we would love for you to scan the serve code and a leader will contact you about one of our ministries that you're interested in. To financially support Living Hope, you can either scan the gift code or drop your tithes and offerings in the boxes at the back of the sanctuary after the service. You can also visit our church website. We're really glad that you joined us here at Living Hope. Enjoy the service and have a great week. The book that's been very meaningful to me through Revive Our Hearts is Lies Women Believe. If you had asked me how many of these lies do you believe, I probably would have said, no, I don't believe any of them. I taught Lies Women Believe. Um, I taught that study, I think, four or five times. When you start to teach it for the first time, you think, oh, I know what this is going to say, and then boom, you turn a page, and there you are. Until I started reading them and understanding them, um, I realized that there were some things that I um, that I wasn't clear on. And so the book just kind of helped get me on the right track early on as I was a, a believer and allowed me to minister to other women. In each chapter, I wrote out every verse that she had us look up and then keep them in a note card. So with whatever area I am basically dealing with, I can pull out those note cards and scripture and just keep reciting that scripture to myself, that that's a lie, but here's the truth that's going to set you free. About five years ago, my sister-in-law and I, we did a study on um, lies young women believe with a group of girls from our church. We mostly speak in Russian, so we ordered, we actually ordered books in English and in Russian, so the study was amazing. I mean, I was, I was the one who was supposed to teach the girls. But it taught me so many lessons that I was like, all right, so it's kind of, it kind of did the opposite of what I expected. Because of my depression, I know that mine started from years ago and it started with lies that I started believing. And then as I got older, I started living like the lies that were told to me. And then when I hit 40, the depression came because of the lies. But now that God has freed me from all that depression, that's the book that just means the most to me that I just want to teach to everyone. It's amazing that we have Nancy that can teach us so then we can teach other people. This is, this is David, has been coming to our youth group for a little over a month now, got to go with us to camp. Um, but as I told you before, I'm going to ask you two questions, all right? Uh, so the first question from Romans 10, 9, who do you confess as, as Savior and Lord of your life? Jesus. Amen. And do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Yes. All right. Cover your notes. Then on the confession of your faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is Luis. Say hi. Uh, Luis, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Who do you confess as Savior and Lord of your life? Jesus. Amen. And do you believe that God raised him from the dead and coming back to you? Yes. Awesome. Cover your nose. And on the confession of that faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Next up, we have Carmen. <laughs> Carmen, if you confess Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, yes. upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Brett. Say hi, Brett. Hi. Oh, Brett said hi too, just so y'all know. <laughs> Brett, have you confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is Emily. Say hi, Emily. Emily, if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're continuing through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we had a great day last Sunday. The whole day was really blessed. All three services were, were really blessed, the baptisms, and then uh, hanging out Sunday afternoon with all the things that were going on there. That was, it was a great day here at church. And the devil obviously didn't care for that all too much, at us having a good time at church, because the rest of the week was warfare. And so I'm just letting you know that. That's how God works, and that's how Satan works. And we move forward from there. Amen. I encourage you about Asperia Days. You know, as you know, we plug into that every year. We do our booth. If you want to, or a bunch of us are going to do the 5K together again, you can get information out at the Welcome Center as far as that goes as well. So let me get into my time here today. And so Matthew chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 17 through 20. Jesus says, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For, I, for truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. And thank you for a wonderful time of worship and prayer here this morning. And Lord, as we gather, as I pray every week, I pray that I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There are people who we consider set standards for whatever we choose to have them set that bar for. The easiest place to go figure that out is in sports. And being a sports junkie, not as much as I used to be. You guys think I'm bad at sports junkiness now. You ain't seen nothing. I've matured. <laughs> but in, in sports, we have people who are considered the standard bearers of who's great or, or what those things. So, for instance, in basketball, Michael Jordan is considered the standard bearer. He's considered by many the greatest player ever because he won the championships. He was a great player and all the things that he did afterward uh, as well. In football, Tom Brady's considered the GOAT. And, uh, you know, yeah, we're all getting all antsed up for that. So, but he's because he's, he's won all those championships. And so he's considered the greatest of all time when it comes to football. And for those of you that don't know hockey, I feel so bad for you because hockey's a great sport. Uh, Wayne Gretzky is considered the standard when it comes to hockey. Many of his records are still, and some of them probably will never get touched when it comes to what he did in setting the standard for hockey players. Now, for followers of Jesus, the standard's very simple. It's Jesus. 
There is no other standard. It's Jesus. It's not your favorite TV preacher. It's not your favorite preacher. Thank you very much. It's not your favorite youth pastor. Thank Pastor Tim. It's Jesus. And in the kingdom culture, radical righteousness is Jesus' standard for those who call themselves followers of him. Radical is intentional. Because what Jesus is calling the disciples to do here for them is completely radical. And honestly, it's radical for us as well. So let's talk about this and walk through these three verses together this morning. And as we look at this, let's first look at this. Jesus set the standard for us. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So we need to talk about Jesus' view of the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets was a common expression for the Old Testament. So what he's saying here is that the Old Testament is what he's covering. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, all 39 books. The prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Hosea, Ezekiel. He's talking about all of them. And he says he didn't come to abolish all these things. There's many in the world today and many who call themselves followers of Jesus who want to take everything left of Matthew and except for Psalms and Proverbs and throw it out. Many people in church history have tried to create their own Bible. One guy was named Marcion. He created his, old, his own Bible, his own canon, if you will, and own New Testament. He totally rejected the Old Testament. And actually, quite frankly, he took this verses and he took them out. Well, Marcion was considered a heretic, rightfully so, because Marcion was a little bit heretical in his views of Jesus and, and of the Bible as a whole. Jesus says he did not come to abolish them. Abolish means invalidate. Jesus is saying, I didn't come here to invalidate what Moses wrote, what Isaiah wrote, what any of them wrote, what Solomon wrote, David. He didn't come to do away with them. He didn't come to repeal them. Jesus' purpose was to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill it. Okay, Fulfill means to bring to its design good, to fill up, to take all the patterns of Scripture and bring forth the true expression of what they are. So Jesus is saying, all that law, even Leviticus. How many of you have read Leviticus? Don't raise your hand. All those name lists, all those numbers lists in the book of Numbers, all of it had a purpose. See, what we need to understand is that Jesus gives us his view of the Bible as he knew it at the time and the view of the Bible now. It's God's word. All of it is God's word. And we'll unpack that more here in a second. So he didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. And he expected the Jewish nation to follow the law. There was an expectation that you were going to obey. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. There was. So what does that mean? Let me make it real clear for you. The Old Testament matters. Amen. The Ten Commandments still apply. Amen. They are a way in which God wants us as his people to live. And they all point us in a direction. Romans 7, 12, Paul understood. They said, so the, then the law is holy and the commandments, and the commandment is holy and just and good. So we as followers of Jesus, as we are on this side of the cross and this side of the empty tomb, we cannot sit here and say, I'm going to neglect the first 39 books of God's word. If it wasn't for the first 39 books, we'd have no understanding of the last 27 books. It all works together. Now, I get that most of us, most of the time, spend our time reading what's written in red or written by Paul 
And that's not bad in and of itself, but according to Jesus, it's all his word. So we need to understand that. So Jesus came not to abolish it. He came to fulfill it, to bring it to completion. Jesus was declaring that he fulfills the prophecies that are mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. He's the one. Whether it's Micah 5, chapter 2, or Psalm 22, where it talks about the crucifixion, and, or it's Isaiah 53, where it talks about the suffering servant, or Isaiah 7, 14, where it talks about the virgin being, you know, conceiving a child. Jesus fulfills all of them. That's what he came here to do. Because the Old Testament, in all of its listings, and all of its points, and all of its laws, it all points in one direction. It all points to Christ. All of it. And so you can't neglect it to understand the fuller expression of who Jesus is and how we are to live. It's always been pointing to him. And you know why it's always been pointing to him? Because Jesus is the creator of the law. John 1, beginning in verse 1, you guys know this, many of you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, none, not one thing was created that has been created. So up on the mountain there, and when God's inscribing the Ten Commandments for Moses on the tablets, Jesus is there. When Isaiah gets his vision of the temple and the train filling the temple and the smoke, Jesus is there. All the prophecies that Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, these imperfect people that God still used to point all of us into the direction of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior of what he was here to do. The Old Testament's purpose is to point us to Christ. Amen. So now Jesus takes this radical standard, because the radical standard was this, we're supposed to obey it. Even more than that. Look at what he says. Keep going down here. Therefore, or like they say this first, for I truly tell you until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. You know the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet is called a yod. It looks to us like an apostrophe. But it's a very important letter. It connects two words together quite often. There are 66,420 yods in the Old Testament little. And Jesus says, not any one of them is insignificant and not any one of them matters. And all of them connecting to how we live and how we're supposed to live out life are to be obeyed. That's what he means. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is comparing what he calls righteousness to the scribes and the Pharisees. It's really just taking a piece of paper, boom, boom. Jesus here, scribes, Pharisees here. The Sermon on the Mount, as he's walked through this, and as he's walked through the Sermon on the Mount, if you notice in the Sermon on the Mount, he does something very interesting. He started off in third person. Blessed are those who. Then you remember, he said in the last couple of weeks we looked at it, he goes down into second person. You are Saul. You are light. And we are. There is no other. Now, and then he gives a description about you will be persecuted, second person, second person. And as he comes down into this, now he comes down and he starts saying things like, but I say to you. Now, this would have drove them crazy. Because no rabbi, no scribe, no Pharisee talked like this. They would never have taken upon themselves as having the authority to say, but I say to you. 
And this is what Jesus starts doing. He goes from third person, second person. Now he says, this is what the law says, but this is how you're to properly interpret it. And that's what he starts talking about. And then he says, I'm telling you, this is how you are to properly interpret. And then over the next few weeks, we'll get into all these other things because they're just illustrations of what he says. You have heard it said, do not commit murder. But I say to you, if you have anger in your heart towards another person, you are just as guilty and worthy of judgment as somebody who commits murder. And that takes all of us and we go, what? What are you talking about? That's what they're doing. I mean, how's that even possible? He's raising the bar to the radical standard that Jesus calls for us to live. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they had, they had good intentions. They're trying to help people to live out what they saw in the, math, in, in the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. All that fun stuff. They had 248 commandments and 365 prohibitions. And the scribes and the Pharisees tried to keep all of them. All of them. If I gave you guys a blank sheet of paper right now and said, asked you to write out the Ten Commandments in order in which God printed them, all of y'all would look at me, ball up the paper, and throw it at my forehead. <laughs> the Pharisees were trying to keep 248 commandments and 365 prohibitions and getting people to follow this as well. And Jesus says... This incredible thing, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you can't get into the kingdom of heaven. Now imagine this. We kind of went through this last week, but it's, it's important to remember who Jesus is talking to, the disciples. He's talking to Peter, that wascally fisherman who likes to shoot his mouth off. Amen. We can't relate to that at all. And he says, Peter, unless your righteousness, and he's from Galilee. Y'all know Galilee was considered like the high desert of California. <laughs> Seriously. He says, unless your righteousness, Peter, surpasses that of these scribes and these Pharisees, you ain't going to heaven. Matthew, the tax collector, hated by his own countrymen. Matthew, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to heaven either. Simon, the terrorist, we call him zealot in the Bible. He's a terrorist. He wants to blow up Rome. He wants Jesus to lead a, a revolt to blow up Rome. Get rid of Caesar, get rid of Herod, all these things. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, heaven ain't your home either. The sons of Zebedee, who are more interested in being at Jesus' right hand than actually serving, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You ain't going to heaven either. Now you can imagine this, because we sit here and we're struggling with this right now. As I'm talking to you. Jesus says we must be better. And we're sitting here thinking, how was that even possible? That's what they're thinking. How is it even possible for me to surpass the scribes and the Pharisees? And that's kind of the point. This last week I was listening to an old uh, Billy Graham video. And... Uh, he was talking to a, a seminary or, or some kind of training of pastor school or whatever it was. And he was talking about being an evangelist. And he, and he was talking about the fact of how he was able to, what he needed to do in order to be evangelist for as long as he had been evangelist. It was humility. It was humility. 
Because Jesus' radical standard is established. The radical standard is grace. It's grace. You see grace in verse 20. You see grace in verse 19. Jesus wants them to think that this standard is crazy impossible. And he wants those who think they can achieve it to say, that's crazy. Because we do that in our world today. Some of you, what he just said, we'll get to this next week. I'm not even going to get into it now. When he says, do not murder, but then he says, I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister is subject to judgment. He's saying, look, if, you, if this person killed somebody, yet you just are angry at somebody and wanted to kill them in your brain, he says, you're both going before the same judge. And guess what? You're both guilty. And we don't like that. We have people in our world who think they can achieve righteousness. They can achieve, they think they're good enough. Some of you in this room may think you're good enough. And your measure of being good enough is that you haven't killed anybody. That's your measure. Isn't it funny how in the Ten Commandments that we don't even discuss the other, that, that murder one. We go to the murder one quick. Don't bring up coveting. Don't bring up lying or anything like that. But you bring up the murder one because I, I know I haven't done that. And Jesus says you're just as guilty. He gives us these whole illustrations as we go to this because Jesus is about quality, not quantity. The Pharisees were about quantity. Do these 248 things and 365 prohibitions, do them perfectly, and you'll get into heaven. Now, Jesus calls them out throughout the Gospels when he points out their hypocrisy. The one who's praying for everybody to see him and doing all that stuff. They're fasting and marking themselves up for everybody to see how religious they are. The one who kept showing everybody how much they gave, and he honors the one who gives the little mite. Jesus' interest has always been the heart. Change the heart, changes the life, changes your ultimate destiny. Amen. And that's kind of where he's going at with this. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the wrong standard. And the, and, the, and the disciples are sitting here thinking, oh, man, how can we be the right standard? They're not the right standard either. There's only one standard. The only way possible is grace. The Pharisees and sat scribes were external. Jesus wants us to think of in terms of internal. Motivated by the inner workings. And Jesus, in fulfilling the law... He fulfills it not only in how he lived, he not only fulfills it ceremonially, but he also fulfills the law in his death. Because the law said there had to be an atonement for sin. So the entire sacrificial system that we read about in the Old Testament was all pointed to one direction, Jesus. And the idea of the sacrificial system ultimately was just to get Israel so hungry and thirsty for an ultimate atonement that when Jesus came, they would respond, and they did not. Because they felt like they met the standard. And Jesus says they don't. Now, Paul understands this completely, and we can kind of go here and figure this out as well. Turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, or you can look on the screen, whatever you want to do. I'm turning because I need bigger font. I'm blind. Amen. Paul says this. This is why it's grace. And you, 
were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Now, trespasses, you know what trespasses means? Breaking the law. Sins is missing the mark, dishonoring God, not putting God first. And dead means dead. Necros is the word. You were dead. Dead means unable to revive yourself, unable to bring life back into your body. You had no power, none, zero. Does it matter how many old ladies you helped across the street? Does it even matter how much money you gave to whatever you gave money to that would have been philanthropic and worthy? It doesn't matter. Any, none of that stuff sur surpasses the righteousness of Jesus. We too, we too being Paul, and us in this case, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclination of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were. See, we were guilty before. We were dead and we were guilty. We were guilty of trying to earn it ourselves. Guilty of taking God's word, hearing it, and saying, Pfft. saying, I got a different interpretation. That's what we do, right? See, we have to put the onus on us because we don't want to be accountable to a God. Since I don't want to be accountable to God, I got to make my own law. And meanwhile, all we're doing is wallowing in death and the wrath of God. Now, I know people don't like to hear about that stuff anymore in the 2023 church, but this is truth. Amen. Verse 4, but God. Say, but God. But God. I'm telling you guys, I'm going to do a series one day called The Great Butts in the Bible. There's a lot of good ones. This is a really good one. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive. Who made you alive as a follower of Jesus? Oh, wow. I'm only going to get four. Who made you alive? How about being a little bit alive here? It kind of helps. He made us alive. Start looking at what God has done for you instead of trying to earn something that you can't earn anyway. He made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in the law. We broke the law. You are saved by grace. Grace, 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 unmerited favor. This is the remarkable thing, it's verse six. He raised us, us, us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ. As a follower of Jesus, who trusts in Jesus as Lord and Savior, who looks to him and his righteousness, he puts us with him in heavens you got a seat at the table, as the expression goes. And why does he do this? This is incredible. So that in the coming ages, that's us, by the way. We're the coming ages. When this was written, we were the coming ages. He might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we display the riches of his grace 
and his immeasurable kindness to us. Now, if that doesn't take your mind and your prefrontal cortex and go, just go back and read that again. Verse 8, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. God, 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 God. It is God's gift. Let's let's do our rich spring review of gifts that y'all love around here. All the moms and grandmas love me when I do this to them. A gift is free. It's given because you love someone, you care for someone, you just want to be nice to them. So at Christmas, Santa gets it wrong. Santa says, have you been a good boy or good girl this year? Then what's on your list? If you've been a good boy or good girl, we'll give you your gifts. That's what Santa says, amen? That's that's not grace. And mommy and daddy and grandma and grandpa came along and said, have you been a good boy or a good girl this year? If you have, we'll give you some good, good, some good gifts at Christmas. That's not grace. That's called payment for services rendered. They kept you sane. You didn't kill them, kill them, quote unquote, don't get all mad at me. They survived the last 364 days, and for that, you give them something. That wasn't a gift. Gift is free, not earned in any way, shape, or form. Not from works, so that no man can boast. Because that's what we would do. That's what we do do. Billy Graham. I'll talk to him. We'll come back to him later. Humility he found to be the key to being an evangelist for an extended period of time. And people say, people ask him why humility? Of all the things that Billy Graham was gifted with, and let's just be honest, folks. For most of us in here who are old enough to remember Billy Graham, we would measure, he would be our measuring stick for being a worthy Christian. And we always say that. Look, I ain't Billy Graham. You're right. But guess what? Billy Graham, apart from Jesus, his righteousness doesn't surpass either. That's the point. Humility. He says, look, in God's providence, that person came to my crusade and responded to the call. I was just one person in the part of that whole process. That person could have came and and their grandmother or their mother had been praying for them for decades and they just happened to come to a Billy Graham crusade and I was the one who made an invitation and they responded. What about him? Maybe they went to Sunday school and they were a rabble-rousing Sunday schooler, didn't care to be there, didn't want to pay attention to the teacher, just wanted to run around and throw things and throw spitballs and do whatever they wanted to do. But that Sunday school teacher prayed for him as well and they prayed for him and that person, he's just part of the machine that is the grace of God moving in the lives of people. It's humble. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. He saved us for a purpose. We didn't earn it. And those things he saved us to do don't earn us either. They're they're a blessing that he's bestowed upon us by the indwelling of the Spirit, and he's prepared in advance for us to do. It is a gift to us to be of his service. God doesn't need us. God's not in some identity crisis. But he loves us. And he's shown us mercy. We can't boast in anything that God has done in our lives. We can't boast in our own works to think that that's enough. Jesus is very clear here. Unless your righteousness surpasses, really what it is, is unless your righteousness surpasses me, forget it. Forget it. 
Not, not going there. Not going where you think you're going. It's remarkable, the grace of God in our lives. Jesus, folks, simplifies the radical standard. He simplified the law. All those prohibitions and all those laws and all the things that I'm sure the disciples are trying to wade their way through right now and try to figure out. And it was like, wait, well, this, is, this is blowing us away. I mean, this is, man, this is unattainable. Correct. My friend, God wants you at the place where you realize, look at me, listen to me, you can't get to heaven on your own, period, end of discussion. He's clear. I don't know how you can get more clear. So he takes all of this, and he says this in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, because he was asked, what, what's, what laws do I have to follow? What does all this stuff? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. See, by the power of the Spirit, the ability to love is embedded within us. See, Jesus came and he abolished, fulfilled, not abolished, fulfilled, fulfilled, abolished. What he abolished was that we couldn't earn it. What he abolished is us trying to have to earn it. When he fulfills the law with his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection, he takes all of that and he puts it on us. So then it's not me trying to attain any type of righteousness before God because I can't obtain it. God knows that. He sent Jesus to die in our place for that. And he just says, Rich, quit trying to earn it and take mine because I'm the only one who did. And I'm the only one who ever will. See, God's standard was so high that it took God to fulfill it. Why? Because he's perfect. And we're not. Say amen. Amen. So it took perfect God with a perfect law, with a perfect son, to come as a perfect man, to fulfill the law perfectly, to die perfectly, to rise perfectly, to ascend perfectly, to come back perfectly so that we may be described as the indescribable riches of the glories of his grace. That is profound. And y'all are like, what? (laughs) That's who you are in Christ. So that following him, because obedience still matters, it's not even up to us except for one thing. Surrender. And give your life to Christ. And even after you give your life to Christ, we are to surrender every single day. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. See, our problem as followers of Jesus in our world today is we don't want to do that every day. I mean, let's just be honest, folks. There are certain days when it's going to be about me. Ephesians 2. Because that's our inclination. You can look up on the screen or you can turn to Romans chapter 8 if you want to. It's a great summary of what we've been talking about here this morning. And I'm going to read this kind of quickly. Because I want to give us a chance to respond to this. Romans 8 starts with one of the most remarkable verses in all of Scripture. Therefore, therefore is therefore because he, Paul's been describing all of this stuff in Romans 1 through 7. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ 
Jesus. Yeah. You're not condemned in Christ. Why? Because Jesus, perfect God, perfect law, perfect son, perfect man, perfect atonement. You're not condemned. So why are you condemning yourself? That's another sermon for another day. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. We're not bound by the law of sin and death anymore because we have faith in Christ and the spirit of life is in us. Why? Because in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a virgin, born under the law, to live out the law. He became sin that knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh. Why? Because the flesh can't do it. God did. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God. He's the perfect God, perfect Son, perfect man, fully obeyed perfectly. You get, the, you get the picture. Boom, 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 boom. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Jesus is our sin offering in our place in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled. What was the law's requirement? That we die. That's what the requirement was. In us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set now on things of the spirit. Things of the spirit like what? Love the Lord your God with all, hearts, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The law is fulfilled in those two things. Do those two things, you to be amazed how much of the law by the power of the spirit you can fulfill. Amen. Do. You can't atone for yourself, but you don't have to worry about that. Jesus did that. Now, the mindset of the flesh is what? Death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. That's what those who say they can earn it do. I'm good enough. I'll just compare myself to somebody more evil than me in my sight, and God's just going to have to accept my terms. Doesn't work that way. And if God don't like my terms, then I guess I'll deal with the consequence. That is one of the most sad and depressing things I've ever heard somebody say. I've heard somebody say that. God don't like my standard, then I'll just, I'll just go where he, wherever. You don't have to do that. Why would you want to do that? When heaven is your home, if you want it to be. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Which basically says your work that you think is good enough doesn't please him at all. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. That's pretty simple. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then the Spirit is not in you and you do not belong to him. I didn't say it. Paul did. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit, you guys, we quote this all the time, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Amen. Jesus, before the foundation of the world, son of God, perfect son, perfect man, fulfilling a perfect law, dying a perfect death, raised to life perfectly, ascending to the right hand of his father perfectly. 
He ascends, Holy Spirit descends. The perfect third person of the Trinity who had the, was the power that raised Jesus from the dead, who now lives in you and me, who call ourselves followers of Jesus. That's who lives in us. Amen. And in the kingdom culture, radical righteousness is able to take place. And we can follow the Jesus standard, not because of us, but because of him. Amen. And that's what he expects from you and me. Father God, we thank you for this time in your word. We thank you for this message. Lord, I pray that you would speak to the minds and hearts of all of us in this room. Lord, have us not try and earn it, but have faith and trust in you. Lord, if anybody is here this morning who's never committed their life to Jesus, I pray they do that. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I can't, I can't meet the standard. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins in my place. And today, God, I make him Lord and Savior of my life. Lord, I pray your spirit has not dwelt them and affirms these decisions they've made in their hearts and in their minds so that they can respond to you and the call you've placed on their life. Lord, for those of us in this room who like to keep trying to earn it, and all it does is bring us self-condemnation and a life of noise and struggle instead of a life of life and peace. We confess those things to you and ask for forgiveness. Let us live by the power that raised Jesus from the dead for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. Turned my mic off. Oh my gosh. So sorry. Here we go. Remember those walls? Remember those walls that we call sin and shame? They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants, remember those giants who we call death and grave. They were like mountains that we stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who He is, He loves us. This is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let Him proclaim. This is our God, He Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful week. You're dismissed.